we will begin with an update on NFPA 3000, the standard for an active shooter hostile event response, or the ASHER program. Providing this update is someone who is no stranger to this conference. She served seven years as a fire paramedic with the City of Memphis Fire Department and remains a member of IAFF Local 1784. She left Memphis to become the first fire-based EMS specialist at the IAFF in 1993. After 26 years with the IFF, she retired from her position as assistant to the general president for technical assistance and information resources, and now serves as the president of the International Public Safety Data Institute. Please join me in welcoming me, my predecessor and my friend, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill. Good morning. Sandy Hook, Orlando, Aurora, Parkland, Clark County, El Paso, Dayton. We could go on and on with the list. It's not about if, it's about when. In the last two weeks, law enforcement have arrested seven individuals in separate cases, five just in the last week, planning mass shootings. From Florida to Connecticut to Iowa. Across this country, law enforcement is on high alert for domestic terror. Again, it's not if, it's when. We have to be prepared, you have to be prepared. And so that makes our conversation this morning about NFPA 3000 all the more relevant. It makes the conversations that you're about to hear about past events and lessons learned all the more relevant. We live in a new normal, and we have to understand that we have to prepare. So I'm going to go over with you just a little bit about NFPA 3000 this morning and why it is so relevant to you that you pay attention, that you participate, and that you see what the standards have to offer for you. NFPA 3000, first of all, I'll tell you what it does. It helps you to understand, first of all, that this is a community-wide event. When these things occur, everybody is involved. And so it's going to provide resources, not just for fire, but for all aspects of the community. It's going to give you tools, not just for planning, but the response and also the recovery. What does it not do? Very important, it's not going to give you any prevention tips. I wish we knew those. It will also not give you local tactics. So that is still left up, much like we do with the other standards, like 1710. There's no tactics, but it gives you the roundabout way to understand how to plan, respond, and recover. There are four main concepts within 3,000. Those concepts address the whole community, as I had indicated. They also address this unified command, our integrated response, and of course, a planned recovery. So it's laid out in these four concepts, and we'll look at the first one being the whole community. And one of the things that I want you to understand is that everybody has a role. Everybody has a role today, from your teachers in the schools, to you as responders, to law enforcement, to hospitals, to those doing victims assistance. There are multiple roles when one of these events occur. And so we have to have that whole community concept. The second concept is about unified command. And we talk about that often in the arena of having fire and law enforcement together. And certainly that is important and addressed. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But unified command is absolutely key. One of the concepts that you might not think about, particularly if one of these events occur in a facility, you might want to have some sort of location representative. So the standard addresses that. Someone from the building. If it's a church, someone from the church. Wherever this might occur, the mall, that you bring in someone from the facility, someone from the arena where these events occur. And so thinking about that in the moment, how to stand up that unified command. And often we think unified command is just communications capability. This is face-to-face. We're not talking about two separate command posts. 
We're talking about face-to-face. Being able to communicate face-to-face is imperative. The third concept um, within the standard really talks about this integrated response and how we achieve that. And so it looks at the competencies. It looks at how do we uh, strive to train together, to respond together. And certainly in the law enforcement community, um, this is key. So competencies for the law enforcement, first time out of the box for them, by the way. When we brought the law enforcement community into the room to start discussing the standard, they were extremely uncomfortable with this whole concept of having uh, a standard to tell them what to do and how to respond until they better understood that we're just talking about the guide, the standard for the minimum of what you need to prepare, how you respond, and how you recover. And so we talk about not only law enforcement competencies, but those for fire as well. And so you're going to see tasks by zones. You'll see the integration response. You'll have some plans, guides for how to do those responses better. And certainly the competencies are included. One of the things that you'll recognize right in the standard is something that we've dealt with for years in the hazmat arena, right? Our response zones, the hot, warm, cold zones. So this concept translates right into NFPA 3000 in looking at responding to these types of events, whether it's an active shooter, whether it's an IED, whether it is a, a vehicle uh, used as a weapon. These types of responses, we still have this zone response capability. And so understanding, and the photo that you have in front of you, the graphic, is more of a high-rise type event. But this could be laid out across uh, a geographic area, much like what you're going to hear in Clark County. And the zones can be dynamic, given the circumstances. And so we want to make sure that we understand and who responds in each of those zones. So the standard addresses that. The known hazard direct uh, threat zone is the hot zone. Our indirect threat zone um, is where we can respond for victims' assistance to get the victims out to save lives. What we say is uh, law enforcement stops the killing, fire stops the dying. And that's the response zone for stopping the dying. And then the cold zone where we have little threat, where we begin to do some reunification, we begin to do um, some other activities within the response. Then we have the fourth concept, which is our planned recovery. And in the planned recovery, when do you think that begins? Does it begin as soon as the incident begins? Does it begin when the incident's over? How about 24 hours after the incident's over? Does it actually start today? The answer I hope that you would arrive at is today, right? Recovery begins now, you have to think ahead, not just for the response, but how do we recover from such an event? And so these are the kinds of things that the standard is going to address. There's a roadmap within the chapters, and as we look at the roadmap, you'll see the chapters laid out in these categories for planning, for responding, and then for recovery. So right now, the 3000 standard is what we call a provisional standard which means it was written quickly, it was released quickly, on purpose, to get something out to the community. We are in revision now, and that's what provisional means. You go right back into revision, and so the standard's actually being rewritten, it's being clarified, a lot of new um, areas are being addressed, and so the new standard will be released next year, probably in late summer, so we have uh, one more meeting to go and the provisional standard will be around. But even today, the standard that exists um, is relevant. So I want to go into some specifics with you that are addressed in the standard that I think are most relevant um, to fire. And those are, first of all, our risk assessments. You've always done risk assessment for fire. And so throughout your career, you've done that where we've looked for fire prevention, right? We've done inspections. You're familiar with doing risk assessment. This is just putting it in a different context. So risk assessment where you're looking more at facilities for different concepts. Where are there soft targets? Where are there threats for entry? In a mall, instead of inspecting for fire, you're inspecting for where people can run, hide, fight, right? We're inspecting for where these entrances can be uh, either shored up or hardened. 
So looking for places where these events can occur and planning differently, assessing differently. So risk assessment is about identifying the threats, it's looking at analyzing some of the consequences, and it's looking at assessing those hazards and risks, particularly the soft targets, where we know now the churches, the malls, schools. Hardening these targets, thinking differently than we've thought before. So risk assessment is absolutely key, and that's addressed in the standard. Looking again at our protective equipment, this is a question we get a lot. What does the standard say about protective equipment? Well, it certainly advocates for it as a minimum for both law enforcement and fire. In the hot zones or in all zones for law enforcement, ballistic vests, an identifiable garment, and communication. We have to have that for everybody in those zones. The same thing for fire in both the warm zone and we include the hot zone here because there can be dynamic features which you'll hear from some of the responses today. So the dynamics of the zones and being able to change uh, in any given time is absolutely paramount then that we have the ballistic protection and that you have um, these identifiable garments and means of communication. Tell you a little bit more about the body armor and I give you this, the chapter without the actual um, citing of the chapter right now because again we are in revision. These are things that are not going to change from the provisional standard, however, and it does require a minimum, a level 3A ballistic vest. The rule of thumb is that fire wears whatever your local law enforcement wears. The same level of protection should apply to both. So that's your basic rule of thumb, but the standard does indicate a level 3A as a minimum. Now we did put in a deviation because a lot of departments were saying we can't afford the vest, but what if we can do rescue without the vest? Well, the standards making uh, process, our technical committee does not agree with that. We did say there is a deviation, however, if you do respond into a warm zone facilitate, then you have to cite the deviation. If you're not wearing ballistic gear, we have to know why. Right? So there has to be a justification and you have to understand uh, from a post-incident analysis why something like that would occur. So it's not acceptable for you to respond without ballistic gear. One of the other things that we address in the standard is training. Train the way you plan to respond. This is not a fly by the seat of your pants situation. So training is key. Train together, integrated training with law enforcement and not just one time, ongoing training. Ongoing training, uh, both joint, um, separate, um, periodic training is important. Also, your public education is, in, is key. So we want to make sure that you're starting to train the public. You do that for fire, right? We train in CPR, we train in fire prevention, we do the stop, drop, and roll. Well, now we have to change to some version of run, hide, fight. So whatever version of that you want to use, we have to begin to change our public education as well. So the standard addresses that. Make sure that you're training and it's not something that we can forego. This is happening. We have to prepare. And so training um, our public is key. Lastly, recovery. One of the most important chapters, I think, in the entire standard is talking about the recovery. How do we address those who have been involved in this event? And often we think, first of all, about ourselves, don't we? We certainly want to make sure that our, our firefighters and paramedics are taken care of, law enforcement taken care of. Don't forget the dispatchers. Don't forget your communications folks. Don't forget those who are, uh, if there is a mass uh, death toll, those who are overseeing the accumulation of those bodies, these people need help too. And so that's the whole community aspect. It's making sure that we don't leave people out when we start the recovery phase. And so thinking beyond the moment, preparing even now. So what's your call to action? The call to action that I would leave with you is to learn more about the standard. If you don't have a copy, get online, take a look at the standard. Watch for the new standard that will be released next year. The provisional standard is today. The actual standard will be coming out within the next year. 
So get the standard, make sure that you're identifying in your community what relevant parts of the standard apply to you, and then start to act. Begin to plan, plan your response, plan your recovery. It's not a matter of if, it's when. Thank you.